Um, this we're, we're shifting gears to great now, and this is a little bit outside my area. This, this portion of the program was organized by Mike Karen, who's our extension agent based in Northern Utah County. He does a lot with grapes and he's gonna be kind of the concluding speaker. But our first speaker is Marion Murray. Mary is our state IPM program coordinator and she does everything IPM. And if you don't know what that is, it's integrated pest management. And she's got a, a wide range of ex expertise in both uh, pathology Entomology. How long have you been here, Mary? And you've been in what, 12, 13 years at, at USU? 15 years. 15. <laughs> you look too young to be in here. <laughs> so I'm gonna I'm gonna turn the time over to Mary and she's gonna talk about kind of some of the, ma the major pests that you're gonna deal with with grapes. And just remind you all, we will we're not gonna take any questions during her presentation. We'll, she's gonna leave a few minutes at the end. And then at noon, we will have a more extensive um, question and answer for all of our panelists that can stick around. Um, and so go ahead and, and type your questions as they come up. So Mayor, take it away. Thank you so much, Brent. It's great to not see everybody, but be here. I know there's, looks like there's 73 of you connected now. So that's great. Um, so hopefully some of you grow grapes and uh, need to know a little bit about grape pests. I'll cover some diseases. Um, and what I'm covering is what I think might be some of the major pests, but also some things to watch out for. So this is not a comprehensive listing of uh, all pests that you may see on grapes. Um, and then some insects as well. Um, so Brett mentioned, I do integrated pest management. So I, I can't have a presentation without saying something about IPM. Um, and I just wanna make sure if you are growing any kind of plants, agriculture, whatever, um, berries, that you have a good IPM toolkit. And that's so that you can monitor for pests and uh, try and get it identified so that it's treated properly. Um, so a pocket knife, hand lens, um, shovel, saw, baggies to put things in. And uh, if anyone does not have a hand lens, a picture shown in the lower right, you can just go on Amazon and, and uh, look up or search on hand lens and there'll be a lot of options and the prices are pretty reasonable. All right, so let's cover some diseases of grapes and the one that's most common for Utah and even in the West on grapes is powdery mildew. Um, it's, a it's a fungus and the pathogen name is Erysiphe uh, nicator. And you might think, well, you know, why is a fungus so common in our arid region and powdery mildews actually do best in um, areas without a lot of rainfall. All they need is a little bit of humidity within that plant canopy and they spread very quickly with the spores spread. So it comes along each year if it's in that area because it overwinters on the twigs and on the buds and as soon as those leaves emerge spores form and they become infected. Um, as I mentioned, it thrives in the humid grape canopy, and it does well under moderate temperatures, so up to 80 degrees Fahrenheit or so. Um, when temperatures get very hot, then the spread will slow down. But keep in mind, those are temperatures like daily average temperatures, so we get cool evening uh, nights, and uh, so that's going to probably continue the spread of powdery mildew throughout the growing season. So the initial infections, the picture on the left, are like small yellow or kind of papery uh, window pane looking spots on the leaves. Um, and those uh, infections can spread onto the stems as well. And you can see on the picture on the right, a lot of mycelium, which is the white part of the powdery mildew, just spreading throughout that area of the, the new shoot. And when the leaves are covered, then um, the leaves can then turn a, a russeted color, leaves can turn brown, they can drop. And you'll only see with powdery mildew, this um, mycelium and the russeting um, brown areas on the, the top surface of the leaves. Now on the underside, you won't see the mycelium, but you may see on the picture on the lower left, a little bit of uh, necrotic or brown lesions along the veins. 
So one thing about powdery mildew, uh, when infections happen year after year, it's chronic, it actually reduces the vine's cold hardiness. And so they're more susceptible to these crazy fluctuating temperatures that we now need to get used to um, with the changing climate. So uh, the plants are just not photosynthesizing as much, not building up as much reserves. And so thus they're just more sensitive to cold injury. Um, the picture on the right is a cross section of a cane showing what that cold injury would look like um, with the necrotic uh, tissue of the vascular uh, region. I guess the real uh, issue though with powdery mildew is the effect on the berries themselves. So powdery mildew can uh, attack the berries when the conditions are right. And of course, those that have been affected are not edible or marketable. Um, and those uh, berries that have been affected and the powdery mildew has stopped growing, it leaves behind this russeted appearance to the, the berries themselves. They don't have uh, the flavor that the healthy berries do. Uh, so typically the berries are susceptible to infection from um, berry formation through about four to, to six weeks afterward. And the uh, berries as they're infected can um, not grow, they uh, upsize or they may grow and then crack as shown on the left picture. So with managing powdery mildew, um, if you had it once, probably gonna have it again in subsequent years. Um, but maintaining a good air circulation within the vines is important. It kind of reduce that humidity. And then if you turn to a fungicide, uh, organic option would be sulfur. And it will be applied at bud break, because again, that's when you're gonna get the, those initial infections and then continue on a 10 day uh, rotation um, until the vines start to harden off. They get to be about 10 inches in growth. So one thing to be careful of with sulfur though, is don't apply it in hot temperatures uh, where temperatures may be 85 uh, and above for a long period of time, because you may get what's shown in the picture on the right, uh, this phytotoxic effect on the foliage. And then there's conventional fungicides and we call them curative. So they can actually be applied after you see the powdery mildew happening. And they would be uh, used about every 18 days, start around um, bloom or a little bit afterward and repeat two to three times. Again, it's monitoring your plants to know how often you would need to use them. So some examples are shown here. And if it's just a kind of a backyard vine, and again, if you're conventional, the immunox is a pretty effective option. All right, so one uh, other one I wanted to comment on because it's in the literature, it's online, you can read about it, it's called downy mildew. And I don't want anyone to get that confused with powdery mildew. Um, so downy mildew is rare in Utah. It's only gonna be around if we have these warm, very wet springs. It really needs a lot of moisture to spread unlike the powdery mildew. And so far it's been recorded in two locations in Utah in Cache and Beaver counties. Um, and like powdery mildew, it can affect the foliage and the fruit. So the picture on the left, the fruit, you can see all the mycelium is forming millions of spores. And so it spreads like powdery mildew, the spores move from plant to plant, um, but it's mostly spread by splashing water and rain rather than wind, which spreads powdery mildew. So the symptoms uh, for downy mildew is this, these yellowed areas on the surface of the leaf that may eventually turn chlorotic. And on the underside of the leaf is where you'll see that powdery uh, substance of the spores and the mycelium. So it's a little more close up view of this downy mildew. So the difference between powdery mildew and downy mildew on the top of the leaf, downy mildew has uh, forms yellow or chlorotic lesions. Powdery mildew, you get the white mycelium. And on the bottom of the leaf is where you'll see the mycelium and the spores for downy mildew. 
and for powdery mildew, just a little uh, necrotic areas. Um, all right, crown gall is another disease. It's caused by a bacteria, agrobacterium. And um, we have seen this in Utah. It's around, but it's not one that's going to be very commonly seen. But if you have it, you definitely want to do things to prevent its spread or, or remove it. Infections typically occur through wounds. So it's a naturally occurring bacteria in our soils. And um, under the right conditions, it can enter plants through those wounds. Um, roots are commonly what's affected by uh, the crown gall bacteria, but it can also affect the stems and the, the uh, vines in the upper part of the plant. Uh, so the galls initially are kind of creamy colored, um, little spongy, and then they'll continue to grow from year to year and harden. And these galls never uh, go away. They, they continue getting uh, a little bit larger and larger each year. So they're a permanent fixture with the plant itself. And again, it, you can see its roots around the base of the, the vine or up within the vines. So this is a cross section of one of these galls. And you can see that it's really, uh, the tissue inside is not growing normally. Um, the bacteria have hormones that cause the tissue to grow in this galled and abnormal form, uh, manner that's beneficial to the bacteria, but it hurts the plant. So what's happening is there's the um, reduced flow of water through xylem tissues, or the vascular tissues are disrupted. So these uh, vines with crown gall are not gonna be able to carry as much water and you'll start to see some wilting and die back. And similar to powdery mildew, these plants are also more susceptible to cold injury. So Vines with crown gall are not good to keep uh, in the vineyard. Um, maintain good air and water drainage. Try and prevent the um, infections from happening. Avoid stress from poor nutrition. Any plants that have crown gall, they're not good for propagating other plants. Um, and one last thing is try to avoid, avoid those wounds as well. Uh, so another one that may be confused with powdery mildew uh, is called sour rot. And it's not necessarily a disease. It's more of a condition where the berries have been wounded by maybe insects or a hailstorm, and then other um, opportunistic organisms come along like yeasts, which are fungi and bacteria and start degrading the berries causing a uh, vinegar or fermentation odor. Um, so typically that's going to be seen late in the season, again, accompanied by a pretty strong storm. Um, so this is just some pictures of what the sour rot might lead to. And um, it's really confined to that cluster. So just removing that cluster will get rid of the, the issue. Um, fruit flies can spread these different organisms around. Um, so some people that have problems with sour rot would try and manage the fruit flies. Um, one thing that's pretty common with our vines in Utah is scorch. So on the left, scorch can affect the foliage, and then the right two pictures can also affect the fruits. And typically, this is due to an imbalance with water uptake and water uh, transpiration from the foliage. So there's not enough water replacing the lost water. And of course, we have the heat uh, that's contributing to the problem. So scorch is going to be um, identified by, on the left, the foliage or the, the brown tissue is pretty much uh, right on the edge with the, uh, this is, the tissue is pretty uh, chlorotic as well. So this plant on the left is having iron chlorosis. But anyway, with scorch, you're not going to see a leading edge, the brown area. It'll be brown versus green. And then on the, the berries, you can see a lot of the berries are nice and green and plump, and then there's a few that are brown. And so something like that might tell me that this is an abiotic problem, could be scorch. Grapes are very sensitive to uh, herbicides, in particular, the ones that are used on lawns for weeds. So 2,4-D and dicamba. 
Um, they, those herbicides on warm days can volatilize and spread for a few miles. And again, grapes are super sensitive and you'll start to see symptoms shown uh, in these pictures where the foliage can become cupped, upright cupped, um, or the, the veins start to become parallel. That's called epidasty. Um, but those are just different types of symptoms that are just classic um, 2,4-D or dicamba damage. So definitely keep that in mind. Uh, with the herbicide damage, the fruit can be affected as well, where some of the younger fruit or some of the uh, berries don't produce, they don't form into normal sized berries, they'll drop off. So that would, that's one thing, if you start to see this, look at the foliage and see if you see any symptoms of herbicide damage on the foliage as well. Okay, so moving to the insect problems that you might encounter. And one is grape leaf skeletonizer. And actually this is one that I have never seen. Um, I had to actually talk to my colleague, Mike Karen about it to see, is it in Utah? And I learned that yes, it is in Utah. Um, but it's interesting because it's native to Southwest US and Northern Mexico. And so with it now being found in Utah, Southern Utah, and I, Mike told me there was one report in Northern Utah, you start to think, okay, so here this insect is starting to shift its range northward, likely due to um, our changing climate conditions. Um, so it's definitely one that we'll keep an eye on um, as we start to maybe see more activity of this pest farther north. So it's a moth and the picture on the top right, I like that one because it shows the size of the moth in comparison to this person's finger. Um, they're pretty, they are uh, kind of this black metallic coloration and they fly during the day. So it's something that you might see on your flowers or on your plants during the day. So it's not just grapevines that um, the skeletonizer feeds on, it's Virginia creeper and Boston ivy as well. So the moths lay their eggs on the undersides of the leaves in these clusters of up to about 200. And when they hatch, the larvae all feed together. So they're gregarious. Um, and they don't feed through the leaf initially. They kind of form a window pane effect. And as the larvae grow, they still continue feeding together. And then they reach a certain stage, um, fifth instar, where they start to leave and feed on their own. And that's when they cause the most damage and they're actually consuming the entire leaves and just leaving the veins hence the name skeletonizer. So wherever this occurs, um, the folks to, that manage it, um, first off is to search for those eggs, again, on the underside of the leaves and for newly hatched uh, larvae. And you go back to this picture on the right, when the larvae are first feeding, um, of course this whole leaf is covered with feeding, but Imagine this ni a nice green leaf. And I couldn't find a picture of this, but with just a small portion of the leaf being fed, it will look like a little white uh, or bleached area on the leaf. So that's something that you would wanna look for. Two generations. So look for it in the spring and then again, mid to late summer. Um, so once the larvae are found, you know, that leaf could be picked off and if you get it early, you're gonna get that whole egg cluster about maybe 50 larvae or so. Um, but if you, you're encountering the larvae as they're older, uh, they could be handpicked maybe and put into soapy water. But one point of concern with the larvae is that they have these spines on their bodies that are actually, um, uh, what's the right word? They'll cause an, uh, a reaction on the skin, like a rash. Um, but they can also become airborne and you can breathe them in. So if you are, in count, if you're counting this and you're handpicking, you'd wanna wear gloves and a mask. So they have pretty good defenses on their bodies. Um, but if there's a little bit more of a widespread uh, case and you catch the larvae when they're young, then you could spray with an organic option such as Bacillus thuringiensis. So that's BT. 
Um, some residential options are Dipel or Thuricide. And if you're a, a larger grower, you would wanna use the strain Izawi, and that can be found in Agri or Zentari. So again, the BT would be best on larvae when they're small. Uh, leaf hoppers is like powdery mildew, probably uh, the next most common pest encountered on grapes. In our area, we have the Western grape leaf hopper and we have the potato leaf hopper. Nope. The damage they cause is a little bit different, but they're both uh, somewhat of a nuisance. Um, so, in looking for uh, leaf hoppers, you may not notice when they're young. Um, because they don't fly. They're on the undersides of the leaves and they're pretty much not moving around too much. But this image on the left is showing the young leaf hoppers and what they look like. And this is where you would need your hand lens to see them a little bit better. And then the picture on the right, um, I often get questions about, you know, I have white flies because um, they, uh, these, what is shown here look white, but they're actually just the shed skins as the leaf hoppers are. Uh, growing from one stage to the next. So the Western Great Leaf Hopper, um, it overwinters in plant debris. And so it's around um, most of the season, it has two generations. So it's in the spring, you would see these nymphs. And then again, probably in uh, mid July. And then the potato leaf hopper does not survive in our winters. So it's blown north every season. And so it might be seen a little bit later on. Damage from the Western Great Leaf Hopper is shown here where the tissue, uh, there have the piercing sucking mouth parts. So they're sucking out sap, fluids, and also chlorophyll. So they leave behind this uh, stippled effect on the foliage. And when it's bad, um, the foliage can become very necrotic and drop and then expose the fruit to uh, scalding. And then the potato leaf hopper damage is a little different. It doesn't cause that stippling, but it causes the leaves instead to kind of curl up and be deformed. Um, but the Western great leaf hopper is the most common one we see on grapes. So for managing these guys, um, the most important thing is to catch them. If you need to do any kind of spraying, if you don't want them uh, catch them in their nymphal stage. Um, I will back up and say that the grapevines can tolerate uh, a moderate population. So if you're not seeing leaf drop or really bad um, necros necrosis on the foliage, then you can probably let this pest be. Um, but when it's bad, make sure that you're monitoring, looking for those nymphs, because that's what you want to target if you're going to treat. So our organic option is insecticidal soap or horticultural oil. And then conventional would be just seven carbaryl um, or lanate. So a couple of things to keep in mind for the organic options is that don't apply them when the temperatures are hot. So then you can have that burn on the foliage. And they also must come into contact with the insect. And I said, they're all on the undersides of the leaves. And so the spray would kind of need to be sprayed up within the vines. Um, Two-spotted spider mite, if you grow fruit trees, you know this is a pest on those and a lot of other plants. Um, it can be on grapes, but it's not commonly a major pest on the, the grapevine foliage. Uh, so some symptoms of these uh, spider mites feeding early on would be this kind of uh, brown tinge or bronzy tinge to the foliage that increases over time. And again, it's going to, the foliage is gonna turn in and expose the, the berries to sun scald. <clears throat> so it's not, if you're familiar with spider mites, you get the symptoms of the stippling, like I showed you with leaf hopper on most plants, but on grape, it is a little bit different in the symptom expression. So here are some plants that are just covered with spider mites and you can see kind of this overall bronzy uh, uh, symptomology for, for the plants. So managing spider mites, um, the plants are much more susceptible uh, 
or the mites actually have a much better environment when there's a, a dusty, hot, dry conditions. So keeping the plants well watered so they're not under any kind of drought stress and reducing any dusty uh, environment is gonna go a long way to preventing spider mite manage or in injury. Um, if you're using sulfur for powdery mildew, unfortunately that may increase spider mite uh, incidence. So uh, be sure and keep that in mind. And then if needed, there are organic options, neem oil, insecticidal soap that uh, like the, I mentioned for the leaf hopper, need to come into contact with the insect. And then some, there's a lot of conventional miticides that uh, are available that are pretty, that target mites and that are pretty low risk. So um, that concludes all the pests. And I wanted to find, uh, say as a final comment that if you come across something you're not familiar with, certainly you can go to your county extension office and they can help identify it. But we also have uh, our diagnostic lab, Utah Plant Pest Diagnostic Lab in Logan that can accept samples. And those two pictures on the right, I wanted to comment on them uh, as things to look for. So great phylloxera is a, a tiny insect that is on some vines that are grown on, that are not grafted. They're grown on them, their own rootstock. And this was found in Western Colorado. Um, and the, the one below it is great mealy vine. And that was also found in Western Colorado as well. And as far as I know, it's neither one of these have been found in Utah. So these are ones to look for. And I am in extensions. I'm always happy to uh, take your phone calls or your emails or answer any questions that you have after this, but certainly I can answer questions now. Great, thank you, Mara. There's, a, there's been a few questions that have been submitted in the, uh, in the question and answer. Just to remind the audience, if you want to ask a question of the speaker, put it in the Q&A box. There is some interesting discussion going on in the chat box. If you have something you want to share with the rest of the participants in terms of your own experience, go ahead and put it there. But the questions go to the question and answer. So I'm going to start with this question. It has to do with managing resistance to fungicides with, in terms of powdery mildew management. So what kind of is the management strategy for, for avoiding resistance in powdery mildew? OK, so first off, some of the quote broad spectrum powdery uh, fungicides like sulfur, there's low chance for resistance. But if you're selecting one that um, has a more of a tight range of mode of action, rally or something like that, then the uh, guideline is do not use that particular product more than three times for the entire season and do not use it more than two times in a row. So you can use it two times in a row, use something else, and then use that one a third time, and then you're done with that product. So anyway, that will help reduce the incidence of fungicide resistance. Great, thank you, that's, that's excellent. And, and pay attention to the mode of action, I guess, because two different products might actually have the same mode of action. So you might switch from one to another and, it, and you're not switching anything, correct? Good, yes, good point. <laughs> So next question is on crown gall management. Does that require that you remove the entire vine? Do um, you have to leave it out for a while? What's, what's the strategy there with, with crown gall? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, the vine itself, the, the bacteria is not going to spread from that plant to another plant unless there's just the right conditions with an open wound um, or... Uh, or you're actually cutting into the gall and cutting into another plant, or you're grafting from that plant to another plant. So if it's minor, I mean, you could leave it there for a bit to get a little bit more production out of the plant. But as soon as it starts, the plant is declining, it's best to remove, remove that entire plant and try and get the roots as well. Okay, thank you. Um... There was a question about if there's berries where some are growing and some are not in the same bunch, uh, is that related to mildew? I think you, you touched on that with the, with the uh, herbicide injury. Is there other causes for that kind of a um, situation where you have mixed bunches of ripe and undeveloped fruit? 
Yeah, so um, I think there could be a lot of different causes. You know, grapes are self-pollinated, but I don't know, there could be a possibility of some of those grapes just not fully getting pollinated. So of course they won't form. Um, herbicide, as Brent mentioned, would prevent the grapes from forming and powdery mildew and uh, sun scald. As far as I know, there aren't insects that would cause the grapes to not form fully. Um, but yeah. Brent might have some other ideas. No, too. I, I think you're, you're right on track there. I've seen with each of those situations. One herbicide you didn't mention that I've seen cause that is actually really uh, mild exposure to Roundup. Mm. And what happened in that situation was they got, they were trying to control the weeds around the base of the grapevine and got a little bit of Roundup on the bark. And they were young enough that you got some translocation of the of the Roundup through the bark and into the phloem. And then you got real mild injury that way. It doesn't kill the plants, but it, it really messes them up. And that's a little bit different than the drift that happens with the, the typical lawn herbicides like 2,4-D and, and dicamba. But yeah, I think that's, all of those are good. Brent, Brent, are you able to hear me? Yes, go ahead. So one other thing that we've, we've seen that causes that uneven berry ripening, especially in, we see it a lot in Concord is um, not enough exposure to light, especially down farther into the canopy and um, overcropping is a big one. So just letting them bear too many fruit is a really big one. So a lot of people let, let their vines just get too big and they can't ripen all the fruit. Yeah, it's a good point. And doing some cluster thinning or, or um, other management where you're not overcropping, people will use girdling and different things to try and get those fruit to develop. That's a good point. Mike, we'll, we'll interview.